Hi everyone. Welcome back to episode six of Lab Talks. My name is Ben Putley. I'm CEO and co-founder of Alchemy Exchange. And today I'm joined by Laurie O'Riordan. Would you like to tell us a little bit about who you are, what you do? Absolutely. Um, thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me. So yeah, I'm Laurie O'Riordan, as you said. Um, so I am the head of programmatic over at Digitas in the UK. So I've been in the UK and with Digitas, at least in the UK, about... It'll be three years, I think, mid-year this year. And then I've actually been at Digitas coming up on eight years this year. So I spent about five years in the Boston office before that. Cool. So you must have seen quite a lot change in the eight years that you've been there and kind of moved to different channels. It'd be cool to hear a little bit about that. Massively. So I actually didn't start in programmatic either. Uh, I started originally in media planning or media planning and strategy. And then as programmatic kind of got bigger and bigger, I was like, this seems like something I need to start at least learning about, at least becoming familiar with, because it, I mean, it's the same with all of the jargon across all of advertising in general. It started to take over the conversations, yeah. so it felt like something I needed to know. And then Digitas in the U.S. actually ended up moving the model, at least publicists in general, to a precision team. So they essentially combined media strategy and planning, or at least the planning bit for direct with the programmatic teams. And so I was one of the guinea pigs for that back in the day. So yeah, it's it's changed quite a bit. It's just gotten more and more complex, which I think was kind of the nature of it anyways. Um, We, there's so much going on at all times. There's so many, I mean, we were just talking about this earlier. It's like buzzword bingo in our industry. Every single day, there's something new that you need to be concerned about or, you know, be educated on. It's a it's a quite humbling experience to I would say work in advertising. I totally agree. Yeah, it's um, without wanting to use a cliche, it's like every day is a school day. I think and and not in a bad way. Yeah, I, I think agree. that's kind of the nature of what I enjoy about working in advertising, or at least working at an agency. There's always something new that you need to be learning or educating yourself on, so that you can then educate your clients on. Because if you can't speak on it in a very simple way to you know take the complication out of it, what's yeah. the, what's the purpose of us? Yeah, I agree. And it'd be cool to hear a bit about Digitask. I know publicists have had a really good year. I think you're now the biggest agency. Group. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So like, I think for a lot of people, people don't understand like the complexity of the agency landscape and how mm. all the businesses play around with it. So it'd be cool to hear a little bit about Digitask and kind of how that plays a part in the wider publicist group. Yeah, I think Digitask is almost a, a bit of a the black sheep of the family okay, as well. Yeah, so yeah. we we weren't traditionally very heavily um, media from a, right. a weighting of, and just in terms of the amount of people within Digitas. Um, so Digitas in the US functions very similar or very differently, I think, than Digitas in the okay. UK. So it was a, a, almost like working at a wildly different company, mm-hmm. even though same name. Yeah. Um, so yeah, Digitas in the UK actually doesn't sit under publicist media. Right. So a lot of times you see the Starcoms, the Zeniths, the Sparks of the world, the, you know, slightly older school media agencies. And those are the ones you kind of think of within publicists. Yeah. Um, but Digitas, our media team has been growing really rapidly over the last I would say maybe year and a half two years um so there's quite a few of us now and yeah a a lot more of a solidified programmatic team as of the last year which is fantastic that's cool so what what do you think has been the driver of that growth have you been doing something differently kind of winning more clients what's what's the thing that's been yeah we didn't have a ton of clients that were actually um, activating programmatically back when I joined at least Digitas in the UK I think there were maybe three or four that were always on programmatic clients Um, we've really kind of doubled down on making sure that we're just educating. I think a lot of times in pitch processes and just with our day-to-day clients, they're really familiar with social, which makes sense. Everyone's on social. It's a really accessible thing. Um, you know, it's ubiquitous. People get it. So social is an easy one and search is kind of an always on win. I think search maybe sometimes gets a little more credit than they're due, but I I would say for programmatic, it, it, it's kind of just a name in the space and unless somebody kind of understands the breadth and the depth of things that you can do, they're not really going to make much sense of it. So we've really done, I I think a much better job over the last couple of years, just educating on exactly what we can do, what sort of pieces are in the space, like more channels, obviously the likes of BVOD and CTV and retail now all being kind of one and accessible within the programmatic space has made it a lot easier to also sell in a lot of the traditional stuff that we do as well. It is a nice, um, I think you do have to look at the whole thing holistically, right? Like if you, if you are just doing social, you get a particular segment of the audience, but people look at stuff everywhere, um, content everywhere. And I think that I'm a big proponent of, I have been now for a decade or more of programmatic media. I think it's really cool. I think that 
ultimately the people that create some of the best content is editorial based publishers and i think they often get forgotten or have had their content used in social and massively um it's great to have them using them basically well and i think part of the issue right was what they they were the ones making that incredible content that was their bread and butter that yeah. was the what they did so well and then when it came to actually pushing that content out and making it accessible they didn't really have the the capability and or the staffing to make sure that that was done in a really um a really significant way yeah so it became just content that sat there and died yeah. almost you know and i think programmatic social's great and obviously getting it out people are you know reading things on x or they're reading things on facebook or they're scrolling through on instagram whatnot that's always going to be there but again people are still using all of the channels that we deal with in the programmatic space to read that sort of content we've i think made it more yeah. accessible in that way yeah definitely i think it's um yeah, I mean, I worked at News UK for a while and it was, mm. it's crazy. They had like a social so team and they content. equally, they had people that were literally printing newspapers mm -hmm. and it's like very, that's very unusual that you have a company that deals with very, like a really old technology and then equally a really, really, really new technology and then has something that spans across all of it. So I do feel for these publishers because. Well, and how do they marry all that up? Because they still need to do that core bread and butter, yeah. you know, print piece but they also need to cater to the the types of content or even like the short kind of bites of content that we get now so even things like youtube shorts and yeah. all of that how do they include those pieces when they're thinking about the production and thinking about the distribution because i think that's a little bit on us to almost help them decide what pieces yeah. are important and what pieces our advertisers are looking for i agree and i think part of the difficulty is that of that is just figuring out where your brand's money is being spent, how it's being used, the effectiveness of that, which kind of leads us on quite nicely to supply path optimization, which is a very important topic, I think, um, because there's many ways to buy uh, media. And I think particularly for an agency like Digitas, understanding how you're doing that means that you can make better decisions about your buying. So yeah, I'd be interested to know or hear from you about what you think about supply path optimization, how you're addressing it and kind of where you think it could improve in the future. Yeah. And I guess a little history of it as well, because I think yeah. when I'm thinking about SPO, I think the a couple big things pop to mind. The first, obviously, being that same conversation about like News UK, right? Yeah. They're putting so much time and effort and investment into the great writing mm. and the content builds and making sure that it's credible. And they're essentially getting less and less piece of that pie back in the day. Cause I think when it, uh, you know, programmatic <laughs> storied past, I would say yeah. originally you obviously had to make sure that the pipes actually worked. So that yeah. was kind of phase one, right? Making sure everything functioned, making sure you could actually buy in a way that was programmatic. Then it's almost the, how can we make it, you know, easy. And so then everyone popped up of, oh, there were hundreds of SSPs and it just became quite complex. And yeah. a lot of publishers, like we were saying, their expertise was not there. Yeah. Their expertise was in making the quality content, making the fantastic totally, content that yeah. people were doing. So then it became, okay, they could work with 17 different SSPs to make the, you know, make the content accessible and to make money off of it. And then the money started flowing in and yeah. that was great. But I think the way that it sort of evolved and even with the likes of, you know, ads.txt back in the day, that was one of those um, pieces that, we didn't have a ton of clients banging down the door to understand the ins and outs of it. I'm sure, you know, I could think of one or two that probably had a real interest in the tech behind it or why it was popping up. But the the why that we actually communicated to them was basically just one, it's going to be a lot more efficient for you. And two, more of that money is actually going to go back to the publishers. And that yeah. was kind of the key bit that totally, we need yeah. to get across. So I think the way we're approaching SPO now is obviously a bit more complex. I think there's two pieces. So there's the the bit obviously around just making sure that we're having, you know, reduction in resellers. I think that's an easy one. Yeah. Um, dependent on the client and the size of the, the work that we're doing, I think we also tend to have some preferred SSPs. Um, and that just comes down to what's already working from them as, as a client in general, I think it depends on whether the campaign is performance based, whether it's, you know, more awareness based or attitudinal, you know, focused. But then there's the other side of it, which is, I think, what you guys do so well, which is basically just making a, a product specifically with it already built in. You guys are already focusing on the fact that there's there's only one hop from yeah. one to, you know, the publisher basically to us. Exactly that. Yeah. And I think it's um, 
because it was in, in 2018 the IAB first looked into blockchain as a way to solve some of the issues that you just described there and the conclusion they came to was that it was a bit too slow and I think that that was 2018 that's six years ago and that kind of and it's been slow you put a stop to <laughs> yeah. it you know but now it's like there has been without going too far down the rabbit hole there's been a really important upgrade to ethereum's network mm -hmm. it was denver and cancun they stuck it together called Dencoon um upgrade which meant that fees on layer two which is coming something that we have are much much cheaper and then the transaction times on layer twos are much faster as well so it's that opens it up significantly more to programmatic advertising which is an auction that takes place in milliseconds a second yeah, yeah so <laughs> But then the beauty of a distributed ledger is that all of the transactions are there. You have to make it publicly available. It means that you can then reconcile those transactions. You can see what goes on and kind of answers a lot of those questions around the supply path. It's kind of like a feature of the network rather than um, and, something you have to search for. And I think the, the key bit for when we're kind of sharing that back out to our clients as well is because I think there's quite a bit in there and obviously yeah. you can, you know, open up the hood and there's so much tech behind it and there's so much jargon again, like the, the oh, world yeah. we live in. Yeah. But I think the, the bit that they also like heavily look into is the ability to one, look at that transparency. Yeah. Because I think that's the piece when you're looking at log level data, mm -hmm. that's the sort of bit that gets more interesting because then we can take a look at each individual grain that's been working. And that's one transparent, that's, you know, again, I think it's down to things like carbon emission reductions, yeah. things like that, because of how fast it is. And just having the one hop versus having seven. So it's not just the money that's going back to, you know, the quality, um, you know, production of content, you're also getting the reduction in carbon emissions. Um, but from our, you know, advertiser and, you know, ad agency perspective, there's also that transparency bit so that we can then look through and see, are there other pieces that we need to start fitting in? So the likes of, you know, everyone's favorite buzzword, attention metrics, yeah. things like that. You can't look at it in a silo. That's fantastic that we're looking at attention and it's something that was well needed. But how does that fit into all of those, that log level data? What are the the grains that we can start pulling in addition to just feeding back, you know, attention into how we optimize a campaign? Can we feed yeah. that into our supply as well? Is that something that we can start making more multi-dimensional changes to instead of it just being like, oh, great, attention, we're going to cut this publisher and we're going to yeah. add to this one. It seems a bit too simple. There's other pieces that need to go into I it. I totally agree. It's very, um, it's a very nuanced thing because there's just a whole load of variables that's like, okay, hey, this on average, there was more attention on publisher A than B, but mm -hmm. it's like, there's a ton, like so much time, more that goes into unit, it. you yeah. know, like which individual user it was, like it's difficult to compare apples to apples. And I think particularly if you're looking at a tiny subset of the overall picture, which that was one of the things that I found um, most interesting about the ISBA report was that it was a brilliant report. It was really great to see brands and publishers collaborating to understand what's going on. But they looked at 1.3 billion impressions and could only match 63 million of those. So like 5%. And it's like... Concerning. Yeah, there's very <laughs> few... Like I was actually, I was making this joke yesterday. Um, but... If someone said to you, well, we've we've seen from 5% of the flights that planes don't crash 99% of the time. Stunning like, stats. I'm not going on the fucking plane. <laughs> I'm you know, never because traveling. Because what happened like the other 95%? Yeah. And it's, it's obviously not life and death, programmatic advertising, but it's significant amount of investment from brands. And it is, it does ultimately, if that becomes more efficient, it could feasibly reduce the acquisition costs of new users, which then customers might see in the actual cost of goods because that that is all baked into the price of something is like how much it costs to actually sell this thing so yeah well and not even that it, only that i would say as well what is it i think 3.5 percent of all carbon emissions come from advertising yeah which is exactly. an astronomical amount wild, like i think yeah. some, i forget the comparison but even it's bigger than the aviation industry which is horrifying yeah when you think about somebody who's like oh i'd rather take the train i'm like well all right i yeah. i think we have a lot to clean up on our side as well <laughs> yeah so those sort of things are you know are key to this whole conversation as well it's yeah. not just kind of the one side of things the publisher side or the advertiser side getting more value for their money or us making easier decisions when it comes to in platform optimizations, which is fantastic and obviously part of our job, mm. but the the bigger conversation as well, things like that, you know, reducing that 3.5%, which doesn't seem like a lot, but is uh, absolutely lot. astronomical. Yeah. It's wild really when you think about like, it's just, 
MPUs and video ads, you know, that it and seems again, it's, small. It's a, that's one of the kind of killer features for me of, of a block. The, the reason I think that happens, in my opinion, is because everyone's running transactions in their own server and they have to re produce a report so everyone can compare it mm -hmm. at the end of the day to make sure that money's being spent whereas it should be and it was the right amount at the right time and so on and so on a distributed ledger just like hey everyone just contributes to this one report so you don't need to duplicate those processes which just makes what is streamlines when you talk about it a really really inefficient market mm -hmm. on like one of the coolest bits of technology ever the internet it doesn't quite like match up in terms of like it's so piecemeal versus yeah. being something that could be so streamlined 100%. totally yeah and i think it's, that's cool that means there's loads of room for innovation and there's loads of rooms for improvement which is definitely keeps it interesting but it is i think something that needs to be taken care of because you had big businesses that came in it's like we take care of it for you you know it's like meta did that google did that yeah had amazing ad products for a long time really, and it made it seem easy yeah and it I was think, an easy way to monetize Totally, yeah. And I think people were like, and particularly at the time when they appeared, it was like, well, we've still got a print newspaper. So if you can take mm -hmm. care of that, brilliant. And then yeah. they, they matured and they're like, whoa, what? We would like some of that back. And you know, I mean. And I think that's, it was something I, you know, I was just chatting to somebody on the team yesterday about. I think blockchain maybe gets a bad rep, but just in general, mm. I, I think, you know, we were, we were chatting through the likes of AI, which is everyone's other favorite topic of the moment, mm -hmm. especially Gen AI. And it almost seems like with, with Gen AI, everyone's interested, but, it, you know, just to make a parallel, obviously blockchain has so many uses. It's so powerful. It can be used in so many ways. Obviously there's the financial examples, there's advertising examples, but there's so much more. Totally, yeah. I think, you know, Gen AI basically just had a better publicist. Like blockchain just, you know, it became such a big topic back in the day. And I remember, I think the first time it came up with our advertising clients was maybe... 2017 mm. maybe 2018 yeah, and about right, yeah it was it was a complicated topic so i think it became a nobody really wanted to put in the work or the time to explain it in a way that was simple or explain just the values of it whereas yeah. for gen ai everyone's talking about it everyone is finding the value and granted it is very ubiquitous like somebody can go in and and drop in a prompt and they will get some answers back so everyone can use it it feels something that there is that easy case to make for how we utilize it and how it factors yeah. into business. But if one more conversation says, oh, you know, every business is an AI business, you know, that's, that's the soundbite of the moment. <laughs> every business is an AI business. I've read that. I've heard it in conferences, you know, I've, I've been sitting in with panels and somebody says, oh, every, every business needs to be an AI business, which is great. But nobody ever said like, oh, well, every consumer needs to be a blockchain consumer. And it's yeah. such an easy parallel to make when you understand at least the basics of how it works and how it could function and how it could make things so much easier. Yeah, I think the the barrier to entry in my mind was that it was blockchain was predominantly used for financial products. And that comes with much the same as the advertising industry, a ton of jargon, a real high barrier to entry in terms of and also risk. Yeah, totally it, right. It's yeah. such an easy yeah. combination to see because obviously, you know, if people are looking in the markets as well, the immediate thought is risk. Yeah. And so blockchain was the first kind of connection that most people I think made was, oh, that's that's just financial based. Yeah. And totally. the use cases got very narrow. Mm. And then nobody really talked about it beyond that. Do you yeah. feel like that's been maybe why it hasn't been adopted as much within advertising in general? I think so. Yeah, it's... Um... It's difficult to understand. There's been some really bad actors which have given it about like last year you had the whole SBF debacle. He's in prison for 50 years from bezeling funds from people yeah. and it's like rightly so. Um, but what I think has been a significant change is the is the Bitcoin ETFs, right? Everyone's mm -hmm. talking about it. Yeah. But like that is just a very easily understood, very old um financial instrument that accountants know how to account for mm -hmm. and tax lawyers know how to tax and people know how to buy putting like, it in a way that people get that people exactly understand that. and i think that is a little been a lot of what we've been thinking about is that like if the financial mainstream is adopting blockchain then there is the opportunity for the advertising mainstream to do the same thing it's just about packaging it up in a way that people understand already and making it interoperable with the way that you buy ads now but you get to see the benefits of mm -hmm. like the lower fees, the reduced, reduced emissions and just the transparency across the board. So it's- And I think I was reading something, you know, a while back that said, you know, the 
at least the the Bitcoin ETFs, it was something like, you know, the average order value is like $13,000 or something like that. So it's clearly retail investor. It's the everyman who's who's interested in it. And so yeah. it's definitely something that's becoming more and more popular. And even the likes of just having, you know, a, a virtual wallet or something like yeah. that it's come up more and more frequently and it tends to be something that clearly people are interested in or that people understand the value of maybe is, is yeah. potentially a better way to put it because I think that value exchange or that understanding of how it could change the industry is what we were missing in advertising. Yeah, totally. Because I, I think even now to this day, like we, you know, we've obviously tested you guys across a few different clients mm -hmm. and it's worked really well. And, you know, we've had obvious changes and in, in reductions in CPMs and, and cost pers, which is fantastic. And that's obviously the point that we want to get across to yeah. clients. I think tying in the, and you know, another everyone's favorite topic is tying in, you know, media metrics to business impact. And yeah. that's always going to be the case. That's the game we're in. The whole idea of advertising is making sure that it kind of totally, has yeah. a, an effect on the bottom line, but maybe tying in the pieces that we're doing behind why blockchain is making that effect versus just, ju just being something where we're like, oh, it's SPO based. Yeah. Because I, I think agree. that's important is tying in why the, the tech behind it is so important. Yeah, I think it's we're kind of coming to, I mean, we've been coming to it for a while, but like the impending cookie doom, if you want to call it that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> cookie apocalypse. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, it, it, it's, it feels like the year of mobile all over again. but um, <laughs> The 17 years of yeah, mobile, I've you been, mean? <laughs> yeah, it was, it's another one, right? Like, yeah. it, you have to drink a beer soon. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, but I think there's one really interesting graph, um, which is kind of tracking the adoption of the internet versus the number of wallets that are being created. And even last year in what was a bad year for blockchain, we can call it that, the number of wallets on in total increased by 40%. So it's like the, the internet users is tracking exactly against the where blockchain wallet creation is tracking, which puts blockchain at about 1997, which was like, just before it went absolutely crazy and it yeah. was totally everywhere and i think that you will start to see more and more people having a wallet and i think with we've been thinking about this for a while but the potential for a wallet to replace a cookie is pretty interesting um yeah Massively. I don't know if you have any thoughts on that, but I got a ton. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I do. And I think, I mean, it feeds into the larger identity conversation totally, in general, because yeah. I think it comes up so frequently with m many of our clients. And to be fair, a lot of that, those conversations were had a couple of years ago because just the, the change in, I think, how everyone was thinking about it back in the GDPR days and yeah. whatnot of that whole boom. Everyone wanted to change the way that they were functioning and how they wanted to prepare for the future. Yeah. And so the you know, conversations around, you know, unified ID and ramp ID and, you know, every single, however many IDs there are now. Yeah. Um, those are all obviously phenomenal steps in the conversation, but it's almost like the, the first stage. And I think potentially the wallet ID could be kind of the stage after that. And I almost worry that that's kind of where we're headed now is people are obviously testing out the solutions mm -hmm. within the unified ID space, which is great and, and a great alternative, but I don't think they quite understand the value that the wallet ID could have um, because they just don't, aren't kind of bought into the, the wallet ID in general I totally or agree. at least wallets in general. Because I don't yeah. think it's something that a ton of mainstream folks are, are really getting into yet. <laughs> Not at all, no. It's like, it's, um, I am a long way down the rabbit hole. So I'm like, yeah, obviously wallets, but like, it's, um, it is quite weird even just like if you have MetaMask and you open up a wallet on that, it's like not obvious what you would do. And I think that we're actually having a lot of interesting conversations with crypto publishers, mm -hmm. which are, that's kind of a, a booming, um, market on the publishing side of things because their audience more than likely has a wallet and you would then say well, at the moment you go to a website and you get the cookie notice yep. and you accept or reject i hope you accept because we love advertising <laughs> um and that kind of ux wouldn't be too dissimilar with a wallet but what's cool about a wallet is that it hasn't it doesn't know who you are unless mm -hmm. you've got your own um name attached to it but there's some really interesting data points that you could infer from a wallet without knowing anyone thing about anyone. Mm -hmm. It's like, okay, let's say that this wallet has transacted $10,000 of Ethereum every month for the last 12 months. It'd be fair to say that was a high net worth individual. Yep. And then it might be like, 
And what did they spend it on? Was it travel? Yeah. We and can assume like, that okay. they're in market for travel quite frequently. And Exactly. Yeah. Which then like for Cathay Pacific, for example, like that could be a good person to show a business class flight to, you know, and then that's like a useful ad at the right time. In the right space. Something they don't know. Exactly. And that's, that's when advertising's great. Like it's, people say advertising doesn't work, but I was like, until you lose a cat and you put a stick on a post and someone calls you and you're like massively oh, no, works. advertising works you know? <laughs> yeah. so like i think that is simple way of looking at it as well of like what was the purpose of cookies because i think we get caught up in the amount of ids or the tech behind it mm. and it's the same thing with blockchain right you know thinking about how many nodes and that you know th those yeah. conversations i think lose people which is i think there's a value in keeping that language in there because understanding kind of walking the walk talking yeah. the talk is valuable but when we're going back to our clients and saying what is the value for them i i think i've typically phrase it in the same way of what was the value of cookies for them? It was getting the data from a transaction basis or a behavioral basis. What are they reading? What are they buying? Those sort of pieces so that you can layer that into your you know, full funnel campaigns and whatnot. Those are the conversations I think that are needing to be had on what the value of wallet ID would be because totally. you're getting yeah. that same information. Like you said, if somebody's you know transacting frequently or if there's a volume of transactions mm -hmm. or it could even be you know maybe there's there's conversations around um it, opening up content so that you get kind of a value exchange so instead of there being paywalls which are just yeah. annoying and, yeah. and you know that was the value of cookies in the first place was to open up so that we don't have paywalls but that id will automatically get you some of that information exchange totally, yeah. and then having the ability to say okay great so in exchange for this you get that yeah because it's like you could for like a publisher if it was like um I follow, I'm going to forget what the publication is called now. Um, I want to say Puck, but maybe not. Um, they they do like round tables. So like you get to speak to a journalist and they give you a bit of news ahead of time. And it's like you could use a wallet to track a streak on a publication. And then if there's certain publications you're interested in, you could then speak to the journalist about that thing. or And it shows your it level is. of interest so easily. Exactly that. And it just allows people to like naturally fall into like groups, people that, their tribe if you want to call it that um which you kind of see in blockchain anyway people are very very tribal about their different blockchain tokens that they have but um yeah i think it's it's and to go back to your point about the kind of generative ai stuff it's like their sales pitch was if you don't know something or you can't be bothered to do something use this thing Find and people out. are like that's <laughs> me all the time you yeah. know so as like, i use it all the time so that is where they yeah, got the, trick. the immediate value of it. I think totally, there's yeah. the understanding the value of where a virtual wallet or the idea of blockchain enabling that yeah. that comes into effect that we, you know, as an industry, maybe don't communicate as well as we could. Yeah. I think for for the particular products that we obviously use with you guys, you know, the the supply piece of it that's such an easy sell for me yeah um, because there is such an easy one-to-one -one exchange of what the business value is in exchange for what you guys are doing yeah I think the moving down the line is where we need to maybe get ahead of the game and it's may, may not even be ahead of the game at this point because ID solutions and you know identity resolution has been a conversation for yeah. so long like are we behind which I, I mean I guess yeah I would love your thoughts are we behind on the idea of something like a wallet ID being one of those replacement solutions for cookies. I because you're already well into the idea of potentially rolling that out, I think. Yeah, I think it's there's not been a we've been trying to pull people towards that idea. There's not been a big push yet. And I think that we think that push will be the co cookies aren't working anymore. Mm. It's like shit, we can't really track our ads, which is not great. Um there's not enough depth in the individual like the the like the unified id solutions are like a very b2b solution mm -hmm. for what is a b2c problem yeah and it hasn't got that hook like why would you sign up for a particular universal id you, you wouldn't knowingly i don't think like, i'm gonna pick ad tech company a's mm -hmm. over b's because b's does this it's like no there's got to be a another benefit that's making you do that it's yeah. like um whereas you pick the specific wallet that works for you or yeah. that makes sense based on your habits or how you exactly on that the yeah and then the, the wallet is just then an identifier you know it's like it's why something obvious to say but it's like platforms like 
Meta did so well because mobile devices made them better without kind of fundamentally changing, changing. the yeah. UX. It just improved it. And I think that is where made it more accessible. Yeah, in blockchain is still a little bit behind things because it's because of the nature of, I think, the individual that gets into block. It's a very, at least in the early years, was like very heavily developer focused Tech heavy. and yeah. yeah you had to like really either understand financial instruments or understand engineering and ideally both and then and then then it became almost like a you know a, a fun topic like memification of things or, yeah. you know those are the sort of things that i think lose the general public and they don't quite understand or you know at least maybe this is me underestimating folks so i'm i'm definitely one of the camp of you know that i don't necessarily always follow like how each of those pieces is making changes to the landscape yeah and i think that's maybe where a lot of people are getting lost in the idea of blockchain or web3 yeah. even in general i think that the conversation of the the transformation from you know web2 to web3 is something that's slightly confusing because there's that they don't quite make the connection of why blockchain is so essential to that yeah and it is the it, it's not even just essential it's the whole idea behind it yeah, it's funny. And it's, I think it is a kind of a messaging thing. Like we, mm. there was um, some ads in the tube station near us for a crypto exchange. And it, the, the kind of strap line was like 24 seven finance. And I'm, that won't, I'm like, get, won't logged, get the general public in on yeah, that one. <laughs> I've never logged into Monzo and it's been like, oh, we're closed. And I'm like, it's just a weird kind of thread to pull on is yeah. that like finance is closed. I'm like, when is it like, if you want to go to a bank, I appreciate Out of all it's industries, nine finance five. is never the one that's Lit closed. <laughs> literally, yeah. So yeah. it was like people aren't quite, and by people I mean like blockchain mm. companies aren't saying, okay, they like we love the technology, it's so cool. Have you mm -hmm. heard about this technology? And people are like, I don't like technology. Like fix a problem that I have. And I think that yeah. is where swap it around. Yeah. Yeah, just mm -hmm. like solve a problem first, you know, and then people are, oh, okay, that is really useful for me. And then well, all of nobody us cared about cookies until it solved the problem of making content accessible exactly. and getting better ads and that whole situation. It's the exact yeah. same thing. It's just with new technology. Yeah. And it was like, and cookies was like, okay, so it remembers which page you're on. Mm -hmm. If you come back to the page and go back to like your I don't know, how convenient shop, yeah shopping <laughs> yeah. on asos doesn't take you back to page one yeah. it takes you back to page seven and you still haven't found the trainers that you want mm -hmm. you know it's um and then that then allowed for ads to be targeted better you know like wasn't you need to accept cookies so we can show you ads it's like this is a really useful thing for browsing the internet and i think that is the thing that's ju just missing it's like how does a wallet become really useful for browsing the internet and then boom it's like open season as far as that's concerned and it theoretically functions the same way and i think totally there's a conversation same. maybe to be had and for another day because i think it could be really you know a deep topic but retail is a conversation that comes up really frequently yep. and i think the the pipes are there and the functionality is there because obviously there's the amazons of the world that take mm -hmm. over probably 80 percent of the retail market but there's now a ton of other spaces whether it's you know dunhumby with tesco or mm -hmm. Ocado or all of those different places like asda that you can get um the conversation has really turned more to how we get non-endemic brands within the retail space but i yeah. think the retail within or retail maybe in in air quotes within the web three space or within somebody's wallet opening up a browser and doing you know making a transaction that's retail as well and how do we tie yeah. that in i think the wallet id is an easy way to do that because you're getting that universal id yeah. and you're getting all of that transaction information the behavioral data all at the same time plus all of the, the retail insights that you would get from a more traditional retailer totally yeah like there's no reason why like your receipt from nike let's say that instead of living in your inbox and in your email inbox it just lives in a wallet that you never really see yep and then they know that you've got the tracksuit bottom so it's like here's the new version of those or here's the socks and the trainers that go with it and you can tell like a really nice sequential story about this brand this piece of item and that piece of item or it's like okay we know you've booked a flight mm-hmm here's the best restaurants and hotels nearby and like try this taxi service instead of this one if you want to jump the queue when you get to when you land at that whatever you're landing at and i think that feed of information will be very interesting um i yeah, wish i knew the answer i don't know yeah. the answer but yeah and i think from an advertising perspective as well when we're thinking about how it feeds into to how we build campaigns or how we media plan there's also the element of you know measurement could we tie mm. in something like a 
an attitudinal study or, you know, when we're thinking about that value exchange and how we get more of that measurement in, is there something that we do from almost like a bartering situation there as well? So get them to reply to those different brand questions, but within that same space and tied yeah. to, you know, the, the wallet ID and making it really simple for people to opt in, but knowing exactly what they're opting into without it being an entirely separate experience. Yeah, it's funny you mentioned that. That's something we are actually building at the moment is... I, um, that was not a plant. Yeah, no, I no, appreciate means. it though. Because um, <laughs> then it's like we've been building our own, um, calling it a demand side agent, so generative AI. But okay. you, you plan a campaign using the a Gen chat AI bar. had the better yeah, publicist. It's in there, yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> and then part of that will be, okay, you can connect your wallet and get like uh, whatever it might be, a 10% discount code or a yeah. token of some description or whatever. There's a ton of incentives that you can think of to ask people about what they think about campaign A or B. And I think with those brand studies, it's always better if you can find someone that's seen it in the wild, because like strangely, a lot of the time, the unexposed group doesn't think differently about the brand they've not been exposed to. And mm. it's like, who'd have thought it? Well, and um, also giving yeah. them something in exchange that actually matters or that yeah. ties them in in a bit more of a cohesive way. Because in, in theory, that's all part of the brand experience as well. It's not just the product that they're getting in exchange for a brand. Yeah. And I think the idea of a brand being a full experience is something that comes up more and more in conversation. It's the whole experience from when they first get that one ad on YouTube or they, you know, you, they see you on CTV or what, what not, whatever the experience is, yeah. that brand study is still part of that brand experience. And you're asking them questions about yeah. your brand. So having that be something where they could get a, something valuable to them in exchange because of the information you already know off of them from, you know, that blockchain back tech is yeah. key. And I think it's a, like, it's a well trodden path in social. Um, mm. And I think with the impending TikTok ban in America, if that happens or not, it remains to be seen. Devastating. But, um, right, got all my good content. Yeah. <laughs> there's been some people complaining in the office about that. And yeah. I'm like, this is how it works. Anyway. Um, there will people will have to look at like you know what i mean like if that that's then like the perfect storm of cookies disappearing and then like a large platform a social platform disappearing i'm sure like mark zuckerberg's like ban it ban it ban it but um <laughs> there people will have to look elsewhere mm. and at new solutions i hope one of which is blockchain um we're trying to give them a good venue to try it out um but yeah i think it's going to be a very interesting couple of years um particularly if my theory around the internet versus blockchain wallet comes to fruition but what is your theory exactly well we are in like the 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 1999 effectively of the where near the internet boom. was yeah and it just mm. went like pew, but um it also then bust but um it's by the by but yeah i think that is where you'll start to see just a ton of people get more interested in it across the board um yeah i do think it's the the understanding bit and getting across what the value is and the value exchange that they have that's yeah. going to be key to getting more people on board. I totally agree. I know I there's still obviously a huge percentage of, of increase every year in people who are signing up and, and you know, getting virtual wallets and whatnot. But I think the the majority of people are still kind of lagging behind just because they, they don't see the value yet. Yeah. And I think it's us. It could be something where, you know, we're communicating the value from an advertising perspective, but then it kind of ties into their day to day. Yeah, I think so. And it's like, it's the, one of the coolest parts about blockchain is it's borderless. But I think in terms of then like delivering an audience at scale for advertising, let's say that makes it quite difficult to achieve. So it's like where certain things are like, if you were like, I don't know, Instagram in America versus like Weibo in China, do you know what I mean? Like they are yeah. very localized solutions and then we're Even, really great for advertisers yeah. in those local regions that's not been true necessarily where crypto is a bit more global across the board but even the unified ids and you know there's all of the different from ramp id to id5 to what have you each of those are also very localized yeah and so combining all of those is great and there's obviously the functionality behind that makes it a lot easier to have a bit more of a global approach but yeah, most of our clients are global based or at least, you know, yeah. EMEA APAC based at the moment. So each of those pieces would make it so much easier for them to function. Yeah. And I think it will be um, interesting because I, I worked at an exchange when um, the GDPR came into effect and it just went badly. I think what we were earning in an hour, we earn in a day, which is obviously bad news for business. And I think 
it didn't necessarily affect the US so much, which is like the largest ad market in the world, whereas cookies will do. And I think that will drive way more innovation that the GDPR did for kind of little old Europe. So it's, um, and that I, will be quite significant, I think. Yeah, and I think the um, as well with publishers monetizing their own data and making mm. that, you know, their own kind of first party cookies, which are fine for now, yeah. um, making that more accessible and having more teams that are available to actually dedicate the time to that, not just the, you know, publishing content yeah. and whatnot. I think the next step is going to be having people on the publisher side who are really focused on the idea of making their sites and, and developing a more blockchain based publication. Yeah, I think it will be, I hope people write about it more. It becomes more mainstream. Like I still, I, I see it a lot in the FT and it's sometimes it can be very skeptical and sometimes it cannot be. Um, I think there's always a bit of skepticism uh, when it comes healthy, to right? articles like you, with you, You've got to get different opinions. Yeah. Otherwise you end up in an echo chamber. Um, and that will be a huge help to kind of bring the, the, the content around it more mainstream. But then equally, I think like what people will learn from first party audiences and then tying that to something that just proves the veracity of information, which is basically a blockchain, will be quite significant because you've got like Ozone, which have done a really good job recently. Yeah. And then, I mean, even News UK has got a product called Nucleus, which is a really great first party mm -hmm. data solution. So you can see they're leveling it up internally. And I think it's just publishers are a really great b2c tool for b2b businesses and i think that's kind of what we're waiting for is these guys are like okay we figured it out this is how we can improve it and i think there's a second piece as well because clearly with the information that you're getting within kind of the web3 space there's also the tie-in to your creative personalization totally, how we can yeah. take that piece not just the obviously audience-based approaches are all of you know what we do within every campaign plan but there's also making sure that the creative matches and what signals are we using for that totally, yeah. that can be another piece that we can tie in and i think it yeah. works for publishers just as well as it works for advertisers i mean the creative bit being kind of the only reason that people are a lot of times pulled in the door mm. um the what are those pieces that we can take from the web3 environment or from the signals that we're getting within those transactional bits or the behavioral you know changes that they're making or or moves that they're making within the web3 space how can we tie those into not just the measurement and the audience but yeah. also the creative personalization how we approach people in that space it needs to be different than the way that we've been doing it traditionally yeah. i think that's a lot of times a scary conversation as well they've already made all of these changes in terms of how we go to market within you know the youtube space the social space um not that those are totally separate but you know ctv bvod how we traditionally went to market within linear tv all of those they've made significant changes in how we structure our creative conversations. Yeah. This throws another wrench in it. Yeah, totally. I hadn't, I hadn't really thought about that, but yeah, I completely agree. It's um, just trying to think about ways in which you could customize it as well as doing well, that. Well, even the way that you guys as a company are marketing yourselves in the yeah. Web3 space, or it, those are the sort of conversations that I think aren't happening because people are so focused on even just how they get into the space. <laughs> and then it's the, once we're there, it's the same thing with, the conversation we had around cookies and it just became a, oh, they can do it and that's going to be easy for us and that'll take it off our plate. Yeah. So that same conversation needs to be had, I think a little bit more in advance of what we saw within the web two space. Yeah, totally. It's like the kind of the social strategy is like much more exponential. I would say in blockchain, like we talk to people that hold an ads token all the time. Like we do things like this and like that we have, discord servers and telegram channels and it's like a really interesting back and forth that for we lack have of a better time. word it's just a bit more intimate experience yeah, it, it, yeah exactly right yeah it is and i think that um people get a bit more in, like they, they try and understand it a bit more and it just like it it just promotes a better conversation and there's things that we've heard back they're like hey we could do something like that and then we have conversations like this and we bring that in as well you know so it's like it does kind of it makes it more collaborative, decentralized, if you will. Um, where and it's, it's even more valuable, right? The, the, yeah. Even if you're having less volume coming through the door, you're getting a better quality out of that. And I think that's always what we end up doing. It's the same thing. I mean, it ties right back into the SPO conversation, totally, yeah. right? You're just getting a better quality of inventory and you're tying in things like attention and all of that. So it works the same way. It's just a slightly different angle on the same same exact thing. I agree. Um, so yeah, kind of we've we've covered SPO, attention, <laughs> covered <a lot. laughs> yeah, identity. The buzzword bingo of the yeah. day. Yeah. 
we said we we're going to do that. And we did <laughs> mission complete. Um, so it'd be, I guess, like, what do you, what are you most excited about of all of those things? If you could like tie it into one, like, hey, this is something really cool that we're working on, or I think that's going to happen, or yeah. I think for me, the the biggest, the kind of more exciting piece of that pie is definitely the the wallet ID piece. Okay, nice. I think we're already having lots of conversations around attention, how we tie that into SPO. Uh, you know, making that more multidimensional instead of just decisions being based off of one or the other. I think we're already talking about, you know, the the creative side of things and how those tie in. It really does come down to, and, and the ID conversation has been going on for ages. It feels yeah. like I've been in this world for far longer than I yeah. have. But the wallet ID is something that I think it's almost the two steps ahead of where we're at now because the the ID conversation is just starting to kick off again almost. Yeah. Of, it had its moment a few years ago. People were like, okay, great. Again, you're the mobile 18,000 times. Yeah. And it was the same thing with cookie lists and, you know, cookie deprecation and whatnot. So now I think it, the wallet ID is almost two steps ahead of where we need to be, which is conversations I'd rather start now. Yeah. And Preach. kind of get people to understand and get our advertisers to understand what the value is um, in that space. And the fact that it is just, it functions really similarly, almost almost identically Literally, to yeah. how we're already thinking about something like a ramp ID or a core ID. Yeah. It's just another way. And like you said, it, it's a bit more B to C, yeah. which is exactly what we always end up wanting to do within our campaigns. So it, it's one step ahead, but it's an easy conversation to start sooner rather than later. Cool. So wallet IDs, I'll speak to Chandra yeah. and get that squared away. Um, Laurie, thank you so much. I've thoroughly enjoyed oh, this conversation. Um, would have you again anytime. Oh God, um, don't tempt me. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe we'll get some questions in the comments below and then we can answer them on when you revisit. Perfect. Awesome. Thank Sounds you very lovely. much. Cheers. Thank you.